I'm Ellie Fiorentini, for those of you who don't know me, from BBC Radio York. Um, I'm going to be chairing the event this evening. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here today. I know that we've got a fabulous evening ahead of us. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'm very excited. Um, because uh, Louise, we've already had this conversation, and I said, we'll just get the sycophantic bit over now. Um, but Louise has been a long time. I've followed Louise very, very closely in her career, um, obviously working in journalism, and it's great to have another woman to respect and to look up to as well, actually. So for me, it's an absolute privilege to be here this evening. You don't mind pictures being taken, do you? No, no. Did you also go off in the studio once? Often, yeah. Um, anyway, it's funny what you remember, isn't it? Um, so if you can just keep them on silent, and I'm sure you'll want to take pictures, so that's not a problem. Um, if you'd like to tag in, if you use Twitter, at the York Fest of Ideas, and then the hashtag York Ideas, Facebook, York Fest of Ideas. If you've got no idea what I'm talking about, just ask your neighbour. They'll be able to explain it to you. Okay. So, let us introduce our speaker. Louise Minchin, you will know, is a much-loved TV presenter, journalist, author, and athlete. She presented the UK's most successful morning television programme, BBC Breakfast, for two decades. She's the host of the top-rated podcasts, Push Your Peak and Her Spirit. Louise is chair of the 2023 judging panel for the prestigious the Women's Prize for Fiction. Throughout her career, she's used her profile and voice to champion women's stories and to push for change, raising awareness of the menopause, mental health, women's safety, and an awful lot more. A lover of adventure herself, as you're going to hear. At the age of 45, Louise was inspired to take up triathlon after a BBC breakfast challenge. Three years later, she represented her age group in the World and European Championships, which is incredible, isn't it? Absolutely astonishing. Today, Louise will be celebrating adventure, brave, courageous women who are doing extraordinary things through sport, exercise, and a love of the great outdoors. I know you'll give her a fantastic welcome. beautiful evening as well. Um, lovely to see you all. Um, it's very strange for me. You'd think that I'd be kind of used to audiences, but we don't normally see the BBC Breakfast audience, so it's wonderful to see you. Um, I'm always very conscious when I was presenting BBC Breakfast not to, re not to really think about the fact that there were six million people watching, which is really scary, isn't it? But it feels, it's lovely to be here with you. Um, so today, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about uh, my book, Fearless Adventures with Extraordinary Women. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to the book and about some of the women in the book. And hopefully, you will go home ready to take on a small challenge, big challenge, whatever it is. But hopefully, um, you'll have that. There's no menopause in the book. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> It was a bit of a relief to me, to be honest with you. Uh, but we can talk about that later, and we're going to do a bit of a Q&A, as Elliot said. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, so, who am I? Um, good question. Um, did you, did any of you watch BBC Breakfast? Yes. Um, okay, who watched the other side? <laughs> there must, is there really no one here who watched the other side? Oh, bless. Um, I loved it when Piers Morgan was on the other side, actually, because um, he was always one to beat, and we beat him 99.999% of the time. <laughs> I'm not competitive, honestly. Um, anyway, so I used to present BBC Breakfast um, for, as you say, 20 years, which um, I didn't actually realise until we were going for our 20th anniversary on BBC Breakfast, and somebody said, when did you first present the show? And I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, and I'd always said to my children, you remember the time when I, you know, when I didn't used to present BBC Breakfast? And they go, no, mummy. And I'm like... Really? Of course they didn't, because my daughter's 21. Of course there's no time before BBC Breakfast. Um, I love that show. I love being on it. Uh, there are a few things that were difficult, um, including getting up at... Do you know what time I used to get up in the morning? 3.40. Sometimes... 3.45. And when I was being really naughty, 3.46. 
Um, I, love, I love being on that programme. I love being part of the sort of huge BBC Breakfast family. Um, and you're very much part of that family. And it was just a wonderful thing to be able to do, to be in people's, accepted into people's homes at a kind of really sensitive time um, of the day. And I took that huge responsibility because I kind of thought sometimes, you know, you might be making a cup of tea, mightn't you, while your child was watching me and I was telling them something awful. So I was always really conscious that actually I had quite a responsible job. Um, very funny, I mean, I did lots of lovely things. I think I interviewed, I can't, I've actually lost count of how many prime ministers I interviewed, but I think we all have, haven't we? Um, so amazing, uh, some amazing people as well. I mean, I'll just do a bit of name dropping. I'll try and judge the room here. Uh, we'll go for uh, Angelina Jolie, lovely, loved her. Uh, Jennifer Aniston, loved her. Um, George Clooney. <laughs> I know there are some men in the audience, and I don't want to discriminate in any way you might think the same. Um, George Clooney, I loved, I loved George Clooney before I met George Clooney. Um, and now I'll just do a little bit of a story about George Clooney. So I'm quite unorganised, as Ellie might be able to attest for. I mean, when I, when I arrive on the BBC Breakfast sofa and the red light goes on, everything's good. Before that point, things kind of fall out of my handbag, as you've just seen, all, all sorts of stuff going on. Anyway, I was going to interview George Clooney, and it was in London, it was in the Grosvenor Hotel, very excited. Arrived a little bit late, not my fault though, because I was presenting breakfast. Arrived a little bit late, running towards the lift, and I'm running towards the lift, and the, you know, it's that really awkward thing when the doors are closing, you're like, do I dash, is somebody gonna save me? And I know if I don't make the doors, I'm gonna miss my appointment with George Clooney. The door's closing like this, and this hand goes in, and I sort of leap into the lift, George Clooney opened the lift. <laughs> anyway, that was absolutely lovely. Um, so I interviewed some amazing people. And then actually, it's not very often, is it, in life, you know a moment that changes your life. I had an extraordinary experience. I'm sure many of you might remember it. And if you've certainly read my first book, you'll, you'll remember. Um, we, it was 2012, and I just joined the programme permanently. And my producer said to me, oh, Louise, we're going to do a Christmas challenge. What do you think we should do? And... I love my producers because you give them little ideas which grow into really big ideas. And I said, oh, I know you've done, I know you've done like cookery challenges. And I've been on MasterChef, so, I mean, that's great. But I thought it was a little bit boring. <laughs> I love MasterChef now, by the way. Love it. Um, so I said, why don't we do something inspired by, guess what? What were you doing in the summer of 2012? Watching the Olympics, yeah? I was glued to it. I was obsessed by it. I was like, right, why don't we do something inspired by the Olympics? And she goes away, and I think she's going to think nothing of it. She comes back to me about a week later. She said, I've got a brilliant idea. You are going to go to the velodrome. I'd never been to a velodrome. You are going to get on one of the bikes in the velodrome. I'd never even sat on a bike with drop handlebars. Never done that in my life. And you're going to race with your fellow presenters in, a, in front of a crowd of 4,000 people. At that point, I really regretted my life decision to tell her, let's do something inspired by 2012, by the Olympics. Anyway, forward wind a couple of weeks later, we had our... I mean, being in a velodrome is utterly terrifying because the break is literally... Well, it's probably about like that, isn't it? And you have to cycle around the oval. Went for our practice and um, it was utterly terrifying. The first time I went round, I screamed. The second time I went round, I sort of didn't scream. The third time I went round, I went, oh... Maybe I like this. And Susanna cried the whole hour. I mean, I don't blame her. It was really terrifying. And I accept my idea of fun is not everybody's. Um, anyway, forward wine to the night. And we walk in and uh, it was so intense, the atmosphere. 4,000 people in these banks. And it was like, they all like, feel like they're on top of you. Um, you know, it's super, super, super sort of hot and buzzy. And then Bill says, so I'm racing against Bill and Susanna and Charlie and I are in one team. Yep. And we're going to have our times added together. So Charlie and I's time will be added together. And then Bill and Susanna. So the people who are the fastest will, will win the homemade BBC Breakfast Gold Medal. Anyway, so clearly Susanna wasn't going to go very fast. <laughs> Bill said, I overheard him saying, I'm not going to be beaten by a girl. And this is why I'm here today. I mean, thank you to Bill. And I do, you know, I'm so fond of Bill. I miss him terribly. Anyway, so he says that. And there was a moment when my life changed because basically Charlie went so fast that if I fell off my bike and got back on it again, we would probably still win, right? Bill did a really, really good time and Susanna just sort of sailed around looking beautiful and glamorous. <laughs> but we were nailed on to win. And I thought... When I was so st literally sitting here, so imagine I'm, this is the bar, I'm on this wobbly bike, 
this, and it's very wobbly this, isn't it? Sorry, everybody, I'm not going to hurt you. And, I, and there's this moment when my life changes because I think I can do one of two things. I can go around really slowly, really safely, not fall off my bike, and we'll win. Or I just blooming go for it and beat Bill. <laughs> and there's this moment when I let go, and that's what I did. I put my foot down, I went as fast as I possibly could. I looked terrible, by the way. I'm like, I can hardly, I mean, I, you know, second time I've ever been on that kind of bike. Fast as I possibly could, beat Bill by five hundredths of a second. <laughs> <laughs> which is very important. Um, and I, I mean, I was super excited to do that, but what I was most excited about, I went over that finishing line, and that, that moment, my, my life changed. First, when I let go of the handle, bar, handle, and then secondly, when I went over, I was like, bang, oh my gosh, I forgot how much I had loved sport when I was a girl. When I was 15, I used, up to the age of 15, I was a really competitive swimmer, and I loved it. I loved the swimming, I loved the training, I loved the competing, I loved everything about it. And much to my horror, and especially now writing about this in this book, and all the amazing women doing things in sport, but to my horror, I was, woke up one morning, I looked in the mirror, and I could see I had really muscly, beautiful swimmer's body with muscly shoulders. And I thought, oh, I don't like the way my body looks. And I know what it is, I know it's the swimming, and I'm going to give it up. And I gave it up from one day to the next. So... My message to you, do not give up sport. Because, I mean, and we'll come to all of that, but for me, at the time and now, it was so important, really particularly mentally, actually, because I was going through, you know, I was doing my O-levels. Anybody remember them? Yeah? Uh, they're, they're previous to GCSEs for the younger members of the audience. <laughs> um, I was doing my very important exams. I was having a really tough time at home. So the one thing I really needed in my life was the thing that made me happy, which was my safe space, and I let it go. Um, so that's a real key message, and one of the reasons I talk about this all the time, particularly to women, is to not... You know, be proud of your body because of what it does, not of what it looks like. Anyway, so that's my... And, and I know this whole festival is called um, Rediscover, Reimagine, and then Rebuild. So that's my bit of rediscovery. I, that day, rediscovered sport in a big way. So I went, got out... The, it was just before Christmas, finished in the velodrome, rang up my husband, who wasn't even there, for my biggest sporting achievement. Oh, my gosh, I love cycling. I'm going to go and get myself a bike. I'm going to go and get everything. Went out the next day, bought myself an, a, a lovely road bike with tiny skinny wheels, um, uh, shoes with cleats on, lovely, you know, special trousers and everything with the chamois and everything, whatever. Cycling, all the cycling kit, hat, gloves, everything, all the gear, no idea. And he just looked at me, he's like, you are never going to ride that bike. That bike has been across countries. <laughs> anyway, so then I, so I went, I started cycling, um, which is which I loved, and then very. I'll try and do the triathlon thing quickly because that's in my previous book. But um, a friend of mine said to me, again, I'm very susceptible to ideas, so I'm not going to listen to any wild ideas from you tonight because I'm likely to take them on. A friend says, Oh, I've seen you. I've seen you cycling. I've seen you running. Why don't you do a triathlon? Again, 2012, what did I know about triathlon? I knew there were two brothers from somewhere near here. <laughs> yeah, the Brownleys, who are really good at triathlon. That I knew. Number two thing I knew, I sort of knew which sports, but I wasn't entirely sure of the sports or even in which order. So normal triathlon, as you know, is a swimming, I'm going to get it right, cycling, and running. I did my first triathlon, so I did the 2012, we did the, the cycling. My first triathlon, as you said, I think in 2013, had a panic attack in the swim, because I couldn't see my hands. Uh, when I was doing the 5K run, I don't think I'd ever done a 5K run before that. <laughs> Um, when, my, when my family wasn't looking at me at the end of the, you know, because I went around the meadows in Chester, and at the far end of the meadows, my family couldn't see me, so I was walking. Oh, my God. <laughs> terrible, terrible. Anyway, got over the finishing line, crying with a stitch, looked down, looked up. I want to do that again. <laughs> um, and uh, long story short, I went on and did a few, and eventually I'd see all these amazing, these people with these little tri triathlon suits with Minchin, well, I didn't, it wasn't Minchin then, but let's say Hope, GBR, behind them. I was like, how come they're competing for their country? And I found out that if you did a qualifying time at a qualifying triathlon, that you could compete in your age group at a world or European championship. And again, these little ideas just go in my head and grew. And I was like, imagine that, that I sit on a sofa for a living and I could maybe represent my country in a sport? That's wild. 
Um, I did. I did that um, about two years later. I went to the world, my first world championships, I went to wars in Chicago. And I was nearly last. <laughs> I mean, these are not, you know, I, I, I love what I do, but I don't do it to win it. I do it because it's fun. Um, again, that day I messed up because I managed to drop my water in transition and basically ran out of fuel and water. And, um, and the one thing they say, they say in triathlon is never do something on the day you've not done before. Don't necessarily listen to that because I dropped all my water. It was a very, very hot day. And um, I was running around this 10K course. And again, I don't think I'd done 10K before. I think I'd obviously done it for the qualifier, the two qualifiers I'd done. Um, running around this course, and they were offering water or Gatorade. Anybody want some Gatorade? Do you know what Gatorade is? A lovely sugary drink that would have cured the way I felt. Anyway, so don't always listen to what people say. Um, anyway, so let's get to Fearless. Um, the reason I want to talk to you a little bit about why I wrote Fearless, because sitting on the BBC breakfast sofa, a few things had happened to me, um, not least of which, I mean, you've probably seen in the papers, um, I had a very long and difficult equal pay battle. So that was one thing that had happened to me. Subsequent to that, I'd also had a mini battle, let's talk about, we can describe it in that way. Um, I'd noticed that a lot of the times, when I was presenting the programme, even when Dan came, that always the person, the bloke, man sitting next to me, would always read the first headline, the first story, do the first interview at six and at seven and at eight, okay? And after a while, you just think, do you know, I've been, I've been around the block. I've been here nearly 15 years. Don't you think maybe I could do that? Uh, I mean, so, so, I got, so I did a sort of question to my directors. I was like, could maybe, like, you know, me? Could I maybe read the headline first? Um, and the answer was like, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Eventually I got, you know, you sort of get annoyed by it. Once you see it, it's very difficult to unsee it. Um, and I, I was like, eventually got to, you know, why is it? Why is it? If I can't do it, why? And the answer to that was, because that's the way we've always done it. That's not actually entirely true because before they had always shared it. But anyway, um, I then spent a lot of time writing notes, because I'm really annoying like that. I do, my, I do my homework. Writing notes, who did what, when, took the notes to my boss and said, look, you may not have noticed it, but this is going on. And, he, and I knew him quite well, and he said, no, it's not. I said, well, I thought you might say that. <laughs> Here are my notes. Anyway, so that had got changed, and from now on, from then on, we shared it. And then what happened to me, the reason I wrote this book, book is because you know, I'm really passionate that we have Equality, you know, be paid the same as the person who sits next to you, who does the same job, be able to say hello at the same time. And it's really important to me. It's always been important to me. Even 30 years ago, I wrote a dissertation about women in the media and the portrayal. So the next thing I noticed was I'm sitting, in, sitting having my makeup done um, in the, at 5 a.m. And I'm obviously, I think my brain obviously switches on pretty quickly in the morning. And I'm reading, you know, I know I've got a government minister and I've got a probably something about vaccines or whatever it was at the time. Pretty standard fare. And then we were having an interview. And these were my favourite parts of the programme, those stories about endeavour and courage and people doing brave things. Because I'm an endurance athlete. That's my passion now. And um, it was a, no it was a no lovely interview with someone, with a man. And I just thought, OK, that's great he's doing that. But are there women doing amazing things? Are there women who are running the furthest distances and climbing Everest twice and stuff like that and cycling across countries. The book is the answer to that question. There are lots. And then I thought, why is it we're not telling these stories? And actually, the why for me is not that interesting. For me, the most important thing to do is to do what I know best, which is to tell their stories. So I thought, what I want to do is I want to go out there, I want to meet extraordinary women and amplify their voices, make sure that you all know about them, and there'll be somebody in this book, there are 18 women in this book, there'll be somebody in this book, and there'll probably be hopefully more than one person, you just go get a little idea from them that will inspire you to do something, because I think it's really important for me, it's really important for all of us, that we see people, look up to people, as you said, who look like us, or seem like us, so we can think, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm never going to climb Everest, let's be really clear about that. Um, but you know what, maybe I could do something like that. And there's one really key example um, in the book. Um, she's called Z Alima, and she's a rugby player. 
and she is a mother of three and she also hap happens to be a neonatal nurse and she wants to be the first black Muslim woman to play rugby for England. And she is changing lives because of what she does. Anyway, so I wanted to go and do this, this thing. Uh, I wanted to meet these women um, and then I wanted to tell their stories. And I just thought, there's lots of ways I could do this. I could do it on Zoom. It would have been a much more bo boring book though. <laughs> Or I could do it the way that I like to do things, which is go and join them, um, see how they do it, and have some fun. Um, and I've got a little, hopefully, if I press this, I'm not, I'm not very good at being Carol Kirkwood, but if I press this, you've, you've, had it, you've, you've seen some of the pictures, but there's a little, I actually went on breakfast the other day, and they made a little bit of a film about some of the things I've got up to. Absolutely amazing, it's totally out of this world. watching some of that actually so where should we start should we start with Alcatraz yeah um, so 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 just to explain to you about the book so there's 18 women in the book there are 17 different adventures Alcatraz um, was an um, I wanted some I was there were some particular women that I wanted in the book that I went and searched out and, and met there were some particular things I wanted in the book because I wanted it to be diverse in the sport as well, we've got everything from stand-up paddleboard to rugby, as I mentioned, to indoor climbing with an amazing paraclimber. But Alcatraz, the swim from Alcatraz, for me, I'm still, I'm back to swimming now. And that was just a bucket list thing to do. Um, honestly, absolutely bonkers, because you say Alcatraz, and what do you know about Alcatraz? You can't escape, can you? There's no getting off there, is there? I've lost my clicker. Where have I put my clicker? Oh, Lord. Oh, it's in front of me, right in front of me. It's like when my glasses are on my head. Um, anyway, um, so, oh, sorry, we're going to go back to that one. Um, anyway, Alcatraz, um, incredible. Two young women, they're called Mitali and Anaya. Um, Alcatraz, shark-infested waters, currents that will sweep you away. These two young women, they're 17 and 20. They've done that swim 75 times each. Absolutely incredible. Um, and they took, they took me, they didn't take me there. We went on a ferry, got dropped in. And all I can tell you is it's vast, that water. It's utterly unbelievable. I lost them within the first 30 seconds, and I found something else. But I'll let you read that in the book. <laughs> oh, but the, one of the things I really want to talk to you about is uh, one person particularly. Because there's so many... I'm not going to talk about everything in the book, because I think, hopefully, in some ways, it should come with a bit of a health warning, because you will be do totally immersed in lots of things. Um, let me introduce you to one of the women in the book. This is Kath Pendleton. I don't know if you know her. She's the Mirtha Mermaid. Has any of you watched a, um, it's a brilliant documentary? Anybody watch that? Good. Well, you, lots more of you will watch it. Uh, Kath Pendleton uh, would not describe herself as a natural athlete. She is, though, superhuman. She has swum the southernmost mile in the Antarctic Circle. She does it with no wetsuit on. She's got a Guinness World Record, and she's absolutely incredible. So that water is just above freezing. Um, if I went in that water, I would... I mean, she, she was in there for over 30 minutes. I probably would have hypothermia after about two. So she's utterly brilliant. Um, anyway, so Kath, I phoned up Kath. I didn't... I mean, I didn't know all... I didn't know these women before I phoned them up. I DM'd them on Insta. Hi, I'm Louise from BBC Breakfast. Can I come and do something crazy? Um, Kath said to me... Obviously, I'm, I'm not an ice swimmer. I love swimming, but I'm not, I'm just not, ice being really, really cold is not for me. I've got Raynards for starters. And she said, yeah, I've got a really good idea. Let's go um, free diving. Do you know what free diving is? Have you watched Avatar? Yeah? So free diving is when you basically go underwater and you can go deep or you can go far or you can stay underwater a long time on just your breath. And I thought, brilliant. Love, you love swimming. I'm bit, I can scuba dive, free diving, how hard can it be? 
extremely hard and extremely dangerous. Um, anyway, so we, um, I came up here actually, I, I, my, my, I did a free diving course because you do not do it alone, you always do it with a buddy and you have to be a qualified free diver. So first of all I had to get qualified and actually I came to Harrogate Ladies College, didn't I? On a deep dark night in February, I did my first free diving there and then where was, it where was the pool I went to in Leeds? Uh, the, Olympic the Olympic swimming pool. Where, where Jack Law trained, I trained. <laughs> he wasn't there at the time. Um, but anyway, so we, so she said, let's go free diving. And I'll just give you a good bit of a sense of it. So it's in Finland. Um, this is what it looks like. Yeah, absolutely um, lovely and everything. Um, Kath and I decided, though, that we would go free diving for our first time at night. So we arrived, walked across this lake, which you can see there, completely in the pitch dark, dressed in these extraordinary wetsuits, which are very difficult to get on because they're particularly made for ice diving, actually. Um, and they carved out these, these basically triangles in the ice. And the ice, how thick do you think the ice is? It's about this thick. It's really thick. I mean, of course it's thick. You're walking on it. Do you know what I mean? But in my brain, I was like, oh, it'll be that thick so I can just get out. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It's not fine at all. Um, so the first time we did it, it was in the pitch dark. I have never probably, I'd probably be more terrified. I mean, there's lots of things I'm terrified in the book, isn't there, Ellie? But you take a deep breath. You have to pull yourself under when your lungs are full in the dark and swim. And the first thing that happened to me, I was pushed up against the ice, flattened against the ice, not able to move. And what you're trying to do is swim 15 meters to the next hole, <laughs> if you can see it, and then come up. Anyway, I want to play a game with you. This is not, do not do this if you've got asthma, if you've got heart problems or anything, okay? Do not do this. This comes as a health warning. So what we're going to do is I'm going to play you the moment that I dive under. This is, the, this is the one I did the next day. So you've got the easy one. We're not even doing it in the dark. Okay? The moment I dive under and then I go for 15 minutes and see if you can hold your breath. Imagine that you're slightly scared because what happens when you're slightly scared? Heart rate goes up. Breathing goes up. There you go. You're cold. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? So imagine that. And we're going to see how many of you are still holding your breath when we get to the other side. Shall I be quiet while we do it? Ready? Okay, so I'm going to go over here. So it's 15 meters. You've got to pull yourself underneath and swim along. Are we ready? We'll take a few breaths. You're going to hold your breath when we get to the top. And please not, do not do this if you're in any way going to have some medical issue, okay? Because I'm not insured for it. Okay, are we ready? I don't know if it's going to work. So I'm going to take... Ready, wait. Okay, ready? Okay, when I go under... Ready? Ready? Go. sort of uh, real fears and, and, and not real fears. I mean, I think the thing with the ice diving, and it should really come with a health warning, that is a very real fear that, you know, you get stuck, you can't get out, you lose your breath, utterly unbelievable. Um, when I first did it, when Kath first did it, she came out the other side, she never swears, swearing like a trooper, honestly. When I did it, I, I went underneath, <laughs> I had that first kind of like overwhelming panic attack of like, oh my goodness, I can't even swim. My, my face is pressed against the ice. How am I ever going to get out? I'm going to die. And then I realized that if I pressed my hand against the ice, which was beautifully smooth, by the way, probably detail you don't need to know, but was really helpful at the time. Um, I, and, and back finned on my back, I could get through fine for about two seconds. Then like, oh my God, I'm never going to get there. It was, honestly, it's utterly unbelievable. Got out the other side. And this is why I do accept that I'm probably a little bit strange. Um, took a breath, laughed, and said I want to do it again. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going to move on because I can't believe I'm running out of time. But um, other, I talk about real fears and not real fears. Um, so that was, that, I mean, that is a genuine place to be scared. And I'll talk about why I think being scared is good in a moment. Um, one place that I genuinely really did not like 
uh, was this, was wild caving. Has anybody, you've probably done potholing. Have you done potholing, anybody? Did you like it? Did, somebody did like it. You'd love Christine. She is a cave diver. So she goes into these tiny places with her scuba, di scuba gear in the pitch dark. She'll crawl through these tiny small spaces, find a hole with water in it, put her diving gear in, go through the hole, swim 500 meters. Yeah, she's, un she's utterly unbelievable. But what I love about her and why she's in my book is she goes to places in this world which are unmapped. You know, you can map mountains, you can map, you can map underneath the sea, but she is a proper absolute, excuse my French, badass explorer, and I love her for that. Um, just a quick point about real fears and not real fears. So for me, we, we turned up on this lovely sunny day, yeah, and I'm thinking, okay, we'll go into a big cave, and it'll be a bit like this, and there'll be like stalactites, and we'll just like walk around, it'll be cavernous and big and lovely and water and stuff like that, yeah? We got there, and again, there was a triangle in the ground. So you go in there, I was like, what do you mean I go in there? with some welly boots on, and you've got to go, you've got to, don't worry, Louise, it's a bit of a drop, but it'll be fine, it's only about six foot. <laughs> anyway, so got in there, and literally from the first moment, it was complete blackout, and doing these ridiculous moves, she's like, there's one called the toilet, basically it's like you're being flushed while you're going round like this, you've got to do a Superman move, you can only have one arm up, one arm down, like this, utterly, utterly horrific. I hated it all, I came out, I said, Moments before to her, I said, there's not enough money in the world for me to ever do that again. I had to employ all my sort of tactics about, Louise, calm down, the more you panic at the worse it's going to get. But there's two hours and there's no rescue and it's dark. Calm down, Louise. Anyway, so that, um, and that, again, real fear is not real fear. So my fear then, which was totally irrational, was of th those hills have been, those caves have been there for millennia. But they were going to choose the moment that I was there to collapse. Not likely. Um, anyway, she's an absolutely amazing lady. Um, so just really my point about the whole book is that, first of all, I want women's stories to be celebrated, but also I just think there is so much I learn, we can all learn from pushing our boundaries, yeah? And take that back into other parts of your life. And it, and you're, it doesn't have to be Christine and going into caves. It doesn't have to be Mimi Anderson, for example, who's one of the world's most um, successful endurance runners. It could be that your challenge is walking down a river for 20 minutes. It could be your challenge is 5K. Um, but I just think it gives you so much. What I've got out of all of this is the sort of physical and the psychological benefits are immense from what I do. They really are immense. Um, physically, it sounds really silly, but when I'm carrying loads of books on the tube in London, I'm fine when it comes to the stairs. I can lift them up. I'm strong in a way that I've not been before. I can run. I shouldn't run for trains. I know you're not meant to run for trains, but I do. Um, I can run. I'm just physically, every single day, when I get out of bed, and I do accept I've had injuries. You can ask me about those if you want. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a different person because I do a lot of exercise, and that makes me feel strong. Psychologically, I get, first of all, every time I go for a swim, and I did a most wonderful swim yesterday, I went and swam, I did a, and I can't believe I say this lightly, because just be with the, just go with the journey that I've been on. I, I did not, none of this before I was 45, right? So yesterday I did a swim, which was four and a half K. I mean, five years ago, there is, I, I, there's no way I could do that. And yesterday I went to do this wonderful swim um, in Bala, and absolutely loved it because swimming for me, for example, is my safe space. So I got in, lovely little train by the way, you must go and do this steam train to the end of the lake, all in your wetsuits. Swimmers are brilliant because we're all shapes, we're all sizes. Some of us swim with wetsuits, some of us don't, you know, I just love swimmers. Um, get to the end of the lake, uh, get in and I just, I knew it was so important to me yesterday because I know I'm in my safe space. I'm in, for an hour and a half or whatever it is it took me, I'm in a beaut I'm a small part of our beautiful world. I'm very insignificant, but it gives me a mental space away from all the information we're overloaded with. The constant I mean I said to my daughter the other day, I'm re-addicted to my phone again. I'm so annoyed with myself. But I am. That constant busyness that we have in our brains. And I think for me, all those swims, those runs, those cycle rides are just moments to myself, which some people might say, does that feel selfish? Well, actually, do you know what? My children have always said to me, 
when I'm a bit naggy or aggy or whatever you say, um, Mum, have you been for a run recently? <laughs> because I know it calms me down in a way that other things don't. I mean, it could have been alcohol, but thankfully, it's not. Um, so, and I just want to say one thing before I, get, before I stop, actually. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit, because actually, there was, there was the one passage you picked out of the book, wasn't it? Um, there's a lovely lady in the book called Belinda Kirk, and she is an explorer. So many, so many of them have Guinness World Records. I think her Guinness World Record is for rowing round Britain unsupported. I mean, just an extraordinary woman. And she really, really believes in the power of adventure. Um, and I'm just going to read this to you. Um, she says, we, oh, we did, <laughs> I'll just say what we did. We did, um, I asked her, I said, I'd love to go do something. She said, yeah, yeah, let's go walk across Dartmoor. Okay, that's a walk, fine. South to north, and we'll do a three-day walk in two days. <laughs> I've, honestly, I mean, I've done extreme triathlons, I, and they were nothing compared to the two-day walk across Dartmoor. So if you're doing it, do it in three. Um, she says, uh, choosing a challenge that you find intimidating can unlock your potential because it shows you you can do much more than you think you can. You are much more capable than you think you are. This is a huge confidence booster, and it doesn't have to be a huge challenge. We all underestimate ourselves, particularly women. People are most limited by their own attitude, their own belief in themselves. If you can unlock that and embrace some discomfort, you can be more fearless, bolder, and build resilience. And I just love that, because I couldn't agree with her more. I think that's what I've learned so much, is how all those things that I've done I mean that in other parts of my life when things are tough, and I'm not saying I have a tough life, by the way, but, you know, when things get difficult for whatever you are in your life, sometimes I just think, do you know what? I've jumped off a ferry in the dark where orcas swim. It's going to be all right. Um, so that's really good. And then uh, just another couple of thoughts before we go, and I'll let you do questions. They're not going to be difficult. Are you going do difficult questions today? You know, I, um, yeah. Um, what I learned about the women, um, the women in this book, and I think... Going back to one of the points I made about the why we don't hear women's stories and they're not making the headlines, they're not sitting on the sofa, I think that they are utterly, unbelievably and brilliantly modest about themselves. They really are. I mean, there's Lucy Gossage, who's a 14 times World Ironman winner. I mean, she just, honestly, she brushes that off like it's the lightest thing in the world, at the same time as being a cancer oncologist. There's Mimi, who I mentioned, who's an endurance runner now. Um, she's just cycled the Western Front. Um, she calls herself a bike list. So they are relentlessly and brilliantly self-deprecating, but I don't think because they are, we shouldn't celebrate their story. So it's kind of all down to all of us for you to read about these women and go, do you know, have you heard about this woman? And other women, you were mentioning somebody to me today, Jasmine, Jasmine Harrison, who, was, who I was gonna try and get in the book. Um, so that was one thing. Um, they're all doing these things because they are passionate about what they do. They're doing it because that is what they love. It's part of their identity, what makes them who they are. Because going back to Z, Alima, you know, she is a mum, she's a neonatal nurse, but she, on the rugby pitch, is absolutely herself. She calls her, her nom de guerre um, is the bulldozer. You would not mess up with her on the rugby pitch, but she's utterly lovely and charming. So, but they're doing it because they're passionate about it. They're not doing it because they want the headlines and they want the kudos and all the rest of it. But they are making waves in their own special way, which is brilliant. Um, and then finally, finally, last point, which I learned really from all of them was, and you, what do you call my book? Reckless. She calls my book reckless. It's not, it's called fearless, right? They are, they are not reckless with what they do. All of them, Belinda, for example, planning our walk across um, Dartmoor, Kath in our own way, we went and qualified as free divers. You know, they're not taking these risks lightly. They're not gung ho about it. They're passionate, they plan, and that's one of the biggest lessons I've taken away from it, is to plan. If you want to go and do something, your challenge, you know, f know why you're doing it, know what the challenge is, and plan. You know, I would have not got to the World Championships if I hadn't put in the hard graft. Um, and apart from that, they are utterly charming and brilliant. And I know what you're all going to say, and, and I'm really delighted that hopefully you will. Where's Fearless 2? Because there are so many other women who should have been in the book, um, but just could you know, I just couldn't, there wasn't enough me. <laughs> <laughs> to go around, but hopefully there could be another one. But I just think, thank you very much for listening to their stories, for hearing their stories, and hopefully, you know, go away, amplify it, and tell other people, you know, being fearless is fun.
<laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I wonder how many people are now, particularly women, are sitting in the audience and thinking, mm, do you know what? I'm going to set myself a challenge. Is anybody kind of... You know, sitting there thinking that thing, listening to what Louise has shared there so far. Um, it doesn't have to be big. Bit of work. It does not have to be bit of work going in the dark under ice. <laughs> bit of work to do. Um, we'll start with questions straight away because I think you've probably got quite a lot of questions for Louise. At least I hope you have anyway. But I've got masses, but you don't want to hear from me. Um, there are microphones around this l just here. Probably hear, I can probably hear you. I'll repeat it if you want. I've lost my mind's going because of that. For all that, I swallowed so much water yesterday. Hi, thank you so much. That was absolutely inspiring. Um, I was struck from your very first comments about at the age of 15 and body image. How are we going to generate or develop the next generation of women who are fearless? I think, I mean, it's so because people say to me, oh, you know, it's all about. It, it, all the pressure is now, it's all about, you know, social media, and there, I mean, there are, it's a huge amount of pressure, but, you know, that I, that I was 15 a very long time ago, and even then I felt the pressure. I think what I try and do with, and I can only really use the example of my own girls, and I'm not saying that that works in any way, but to make exercise and sport and being proud of what your body can do rather than what it looks like is really important. And Mimi made a really important point, actually. Um, again, she's the endurance runner about, you know, how she's, for example, she's, a, you, you know, you, we're talking about young women here, but, you know, she's given birth to three children. She's managed to cycle across continents or run across continents. I just think if it can be about what your body does and you can be proud of that, then that is probably the key to unlocking it. But I accept that's really hard. And with my own children, I've just, you know, for me, moving is, a, is, a, is part of my DNA now. It's what I do. And I read some really brilliant research a long time ago, and this is one of the reasons I started taking up sport, which said that if you want your daughters to do sport and continue and not give up at that critical time, it's the mum that needs to do it. Because otherwise they'll just think, oh, that's just what dads do or boys do. So the And I know I've taken that to an extreme, but my daughter, who's 21... She and I ran the London Marathon together in April, so it's working. Um, but it's not, you know, it's relentless. And I, I you know, I've, I mean, there's been so many times I've knocked on her door, probably hundreds, going, "Hi, do you want to go for a run? Hi, do you want to go for a run?" I mean, it, I wore her down. But yeah, I think if you can try and instill and be proud of what our bodies do, than rather what they look like, maybe that's the key. Yeah. How do we, just on the back of that, how do we break down that fear? Because I think for a lot of a lot of women. Um, maybe not exercise for a while, sort of thinking, yeah. you know, how, how do I build that up, really? Because it, can be it can be quite daunting to start with, whatever your yeah. challenge might be. I think, um, there's, I think what's really good about what we are now, where we are now with social media, there are, you know, find your tribe. There might be, I mean, if you want to do triathlon, the thing that triathletes most love talking about is triathlon. So if you turn up at any triathlon club and you haven't got a clue, I promise you, they're going to, oh, and they'll, oh, and you know this, and you know that. But find your tribe. And, you know, for example, they, I'm loving what's going on with swimming at the moment, the massive explosion in dipping. And, you know, there will be a, you know, round where you live or whatever it is, look on Facebook or whatever, but find your tribe. And if you go in and it's intimidating, go somewhere else. Do you see what I mean? Just go until you, until you find someone. And there's lots of brilliant... I mean, I'm, I'm involved with Her Spirit, who are absolutely brilliant at helping women back into sport. And, you know, we've done Couch to Kilo, where we've just been doing weights with, you know, probably, you know, like walk, bottles of water in the kitchen. There's so much out there. So, you know, just try and, you know, build confidence in that way. And then find a friend, you know, find a friend. If you can find a friend... I mean, I, for example, my swimming at the moment, there's a, somebody who I swim with... And I know she hates swimming on her own. So she texts me, and I promise you, I swim, in, I swim twice as many times because of her. She texts me, going, are you going swimming today? And I know if I don't go, she won't go. So then I have to turn up. So turning up with a friend is actually brilliant because I think, you know, you self-motivate. You're going to self-motivate into doing it rather than out. It's very easy when you're on your own to find an excuse. Or set up your own group, which yes. is what Rianne did, I'm thinking yeah, of. Rianne, yeah, Rianne, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, Rian Fatinikan, um, who set up um, a wonderful group called Black Girls Hike because she decided she wanted to take up hiking and she really wanted to, you know, make it much more accessible. Um, and she's done that, and, she, and it's just exploding. It's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, again, so she's bringing so many people into the countryside who might have felt afraid. So find the one, the path that might help you. And as, as I say, if you don't like, just go find another one. Yep. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether you had a cut-off point, but was, um, was there anything that, that people suggested um, that should be, that might be in the book, that you just thought, absolutely, no way, I'm not going to do that? Um, was there a cut-off point? Um, um, no, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to go, I don't want to climb Everest, <laughs> and I don't want to go into space. I mean, but they're quite out there, aren't they? Um, there were points, though, where I had one really um, instructive moment where I think you've really got to go with your gut, what feels safe for you. And actually, you know, the book is not about being fearless because actually fear is a really good thing because fear is telling you to stop doing something really stupid and you need to listen to those, listen to those thoughts, actually. And there was one point where um, I'm cycling, trying to cycle across Argentina and we, which is a very long way, by the way, <laughs> as you can imagine, I was sort of deep into the fifth day or something, and we're on a, we're cycling about 180 kilometers a day, so that's well over 100 miles a day in very hot temperatures. We're cycling down a dual carriageway. I would never cycle down, yeah, I would never cycle down a dual carriageway in the UK. I mean, you're just utterly stupid. And, but it was our only option, and we had a whole safety team, etc. But at that point, our truck, the safety truck, which had been right behind me, me and myself, for the whole way, was helping another cyclist, and so we didn't have the safety truck, and these HGVs were coming past us at sort of 60, 70 miles an hour, and I just thought, do you know what, I've read so, I know so many bad stories, I know how this could end, right, and I was being really dramatic in my head, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to die on the side of a stupid dual carriageway in Argentina, what a really stupid thing to do, do you know what I mean, and I was, I was really scared, and I just said to Mimi, do you know, this feels wrong, she said, right, get off your bike. We just got off our bike, we went under a tree, and we waited. Because sometimes I think you need to know where your cutoff point is. And I'm not saying anything would, bad would have happened, but I was definitely on too far right of being, you know. And I think that's really, your gut is actually really important. Um, and sometimes, you know, my, my, you know, your level of risk, everybody's level of risk is different, yeah? But I think it's really important to listen to yourself and know that there are limits. More questions? questions? There's one right at the back. Two, two at the back. Gosh, it's fate. It's like being on the spotlight here. How are you, everybody? You're okay? You're going for a drink after? <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for such an inspiring talk. I just wondered if you're still uh, competing for Team B and how you managed to get fit the training in with your career. And also, just one quiz, uh, what's your favourite triathlon that you've uh, taken part in? Oh, my gosh. So there's about three questions there. Which one? Favourite triathlon? I'll go with that one. My favourite triathlon was, um, it's called Patagon Man. And it's in deepest, darkest Patagonia, and it's based on, uh, there's another, uh, it's, it's called an extreme triathlon. Extreme because you start at one point and you finish at another because, which is a very long way, it's 220 kilometers. So just very briefly, in that triathlon, it's based on an, another triathlon called Norseman, which is like legendary, which I've also done, which is, I feel very lucky to have done. So you jump in off a ferry in the dark in this amazing fjords where the orcas swim. And obviously I was thinking that I was going to get eaten by the orca. Because why would they? Of course they choose me out of all the 200 swimmers. And that, that there's never been an orca attack, by the way, there anyway. Um, anyway, so jump off that. You swim uh, 3.8 3 kilometers. <laughs> it makes me laugh. I can't believe I do some of this stuff. Um, to the shore. And then there's a wonderful bike ride over these beautiful mountains with glaciers. And then there's just a marathon at the end of it. Um, I, I, and just be really clear on all of these, the lady in the book called Lucy Gossage, who wins all these Ironman distance uh, races, so she was in the race that day. We started together, and I think I finished six hours after she did. <laughs> so for me, it's not about the take, it's not about, it's not about coming first, because clearly I'm not going to come first, but it's just about being, you know, it was the most incredible experience, sort of running on my own for maybe an hour at a time in that marathon, actually, these wild horses. Uh, how do I, no, I'm not competing for Team GB anymore because I'm actually much preferring what I've been doing, which is 
doing stuff which is really immersive in the environment, actually. So that's, that's that. And fitting it all in. Don't forget, I got up at 3 or 40 in the morning, so my children were at school when I got back. So I would often do a lot of the training when they were at school, when I got back from work in the morning. So I did, I, I mean, I, since I've stopped doing breakfast, I was like, where's all the time gone in my day? Well, I mean, you have a lot more time when you wake up at 3.40. But you must have had incredible energy levels, though. I mean, I, I, I did breakfast years ago, not on television, but on radio. Yeah. Um, and you do make the most of that time, but it can also be exhausting as well, as well as being exhilarating. I found that um, I needed to do the exercise to get the space between you know, that very intense job um, being under enormous amounts of pressure and being at home, I just found that the exercise actually, you know, for a start, if you, if you don't do it in the morning, you, you, you some, sometimes I don't get any light in your life. That's one of the things I realised. But yeah, for me, it was actually, I was at my most competitive when I was doing BBC Breakfast. So it, it kind of worked really well together in a strange way. Very good. I'm um, really lazy now, I think. Before, <laughs> lazy, no way. Um, before we take the next question, you asked me to ask you about injury because yes. that can be something that holds you back. Um, I am sure that there are people in here tonight who've got injuries. I know I've got a knee injury at the moment, so when I read the bit about you with your knee injury, and I thought, oh, and, and I'm nowhere near, you know, aiming for your levels. Um, but how do you get through that? How did you cope? Because the knee did... It held you back to a certain extent. You couldn't run, yeah. but you still carried on doing the challenges. Um, it's, I'm actually sort of, it sounds really strange. I'm sort of delighted that I did have a knee injury because I think the book would have been quite different if I'd done, I thought it would be a lot about running. And there are a couple of, I think it's just one run in there mm. um, because there were so many women doing amazing things in running. Um, but because I had a knee injury, I, could, I just couldn't run for a lot of the year. Um, so I, and I had it operated on. I think with injury, it can be very, uh, de really depressing actually, can really get you down, can't it? But I always just try and find a way through and it's really boring. It's physio and it's doing your strength and conditioning and doing all that. And I've done, so I had a, my, my first um, bad injury was um, just before Norseman actually. I managed to run up Snowdon my last training run, run up Snowden, run down Snowden, turned off the watch, you know, so run over, went over on my ankle, on the pavement. My husband had told me not to go that day because I was going to hurt myself, so I pretended it was fine for two and a half years. Did four marathons with what turned out to be a snapped ligament. Anyway, so, so don't do what I do, go and see the doctor when you've been injured and just put the time, you know, I've, I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's without its difficulties, but, and then I had a knee injury as well. I've done couch to 5k from the start. So with the ankle, I couldn't walk with the knee. I couldn't walk um, and started right at the beginning. It's, you know, just textbook, you one, run one minute, walk one minute. And then however many months, months later, I, had the, I think I had the knee operation in July, in April, we ran the marathon. So, you know, it's, it's really boring. It's really, you know, and you ha the best thing I think is, you know, find your way through and it might be doing another sport or it might be doing something different, but yeah, go to the doctor. I mean, I know it's difficult to get an appointment sometimes where I live, but, um, but do please <laughs> go and get it checked out because it might be serious. Other questions? Yes, there's a, somebody up there, there's quite a few on the top actually, yes. You're not left out there, you know, up there. You got the best seats. Uh, hi, thank you very much, and, and um, what a fabulous talk, and uh, very inspiring. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask uh, about your, what you think about your carbon footprint, because yes, I think very we, ought good to, question. We, we ought to be doing things closer to home, and I agree with you, I mean, we all need our own challenges, and, and, and I think it was really, really wonderful the way you said it, but uh, uh, I'm curious about the carbon footprint, and I suspect you might be using your carbon footprint on behalf of us, so we don't have to. <laughs> Well, I think you put that very generously. Um, it is something that does weigh on my mind, and you're absolutely right. You know, if you, if you did the miles, which I haven't done um, on the book, you know, that I agree. It's, you know, it's something that does exercise my mind. Um, with adventures, actually, you know, there are those iconic ones in the book, but there's so much. I think COVID taught me, and the book as well, there is so much amazing stuff that we can do close to us. You know, there really is. I um, mean, I did, um, uh, when the London, I was meant to do the London Marathon um, that first year when it got cancelled, and I actually ran it on the Sandstone Trail in Cheshire. 
but that, you know, that's what I've really, really learned, you know, and, and then walking across Dartmoor, you know, I've never done that. And actually, I think there are lots of things very near to us that we can do. One of the ladies in the book, for example, um, paddleboarded all the uh, canals in, in Britain. But yeah, I, I you know, don't think it doesn't weigh heavily on my mind. Um, it has done. And yeah, maybe next time I'll have to swim to Alcatraz from here. <laughs> but it's probably not going to help, is it? But yeah, I appreciate the way you worded that. Thank you. The lady who paddleboarded, of course, yes. was collecting literate so Oh, yes. Yeah, so, she's a real yeah, so actually, that's, that's a brilliant, that's an absolutely brilliant chapter. Thank you for reminding me. So um, she's called Lizzie Carr, um, and she did this, she had cancer, and I'll leave, leave, try and leave to, you to read it in the book, but she, she was very unwell, um, turned to paddleboarding as a way of recovery, and during that journey, she realised how terribly clogged up by plastic our rivers are she started picking up plastic and she now runs an amazing charity and i don't know if you ever heard called call planet patrol and she changed me forever she's changed me forever i can't go i cannot see plastic outside and not pick it up now so um but and she her brilliant thing is that we can i said to her, you know we're picking up plastic from um, it was in Nottingham, actually, on the River Trent, and pulling, you know, out these, ter you know, Coke cans and whatever it is. And I said to her, you know, what is, the, you know, can we really make a difference by picking out one piece of plastic at a time? And that'd be my brilliant message to all of you. We can make a difference by literally picking up one piece of plastic at a time. Um, so she, I mean, she's even done it to my husband now. <laughs> Going for a walk, he's like, I'm like, what are you doing? Did you not listen to your talk the other day? I'm like, yeah, I did, but I didn't know you had too. Um, so, yeah, so she's brilliant, actually. I think there was another question at the other end of that row or at the back there, yeah. Hi. I'm coming to do the Three Peaks, by the way, in Yorkshire as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can join me on that. Yeah, I'm doing it in September if anybody wants to join me. <laughs> it's for a charity. <laughs> Is Hi. it really hard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go on. Um, hi, I was wondering if any of the activities that you did in your book you still carry on with today as, like, hobbies. Um, yeah, um, so the free diving, I, mean, I, think, I think you probably understood from what I've said about it. Yeah, free diving, I absolutely, I found my, if I, if I did my life again, I'd be a mermaid. Um, and I know how to do that now. So yeah, I'm definitely going to do free diving again. Uh, Kath and I have got plans. She, de she um, will definitely meet up. We will, we'll definitely do it again. I just absolutely loved it. And I do, I do sort of, you know, when I'm on holiday, I mean, again, you shouldn't do it alone, but my, when my husband's watching, I'm like, can you just watch while I dive down 10 metres? <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do. He wouldn't know how to rescue me. But um, so yeah, definitely free diving. Any more questions? You're all very quiet. Oh, there's one down here. Just got a microphone to just over here. How long is it going to take? Three peaks, anybody? I'm not going to run. I'm not going to. I'm definitely walking. Twelve hours. How many? Eight. Okay. Oh, like, no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> 25 miles. 25 miles. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. We we'll get forward soon. We'll see. Um, I just wondered what it is about you or people in general that makes you do something that's incredibly hard. You said you had a panic attack when you were swimming and then finish that and at the end say, I'd like to do that again rather than I'd never want to do that again. Yeah, I think maybe I've got a screw loose. Um, uh, what is it? Um, for me, it's about, again, going back to sort of, pu it's about pushing my boundaries, getting through stuff that I think is really hard. And I think, you know, for example, with the free diving, you know, I do get, a ma and not everybody gets this as well, I do get a massive, whether it's adrenaline or endorphins, buzz from doing stuff like that. I really do. And for example, go back, back to Pascan Man, you know, that buzz doesn't last one, one hour. After Patagon Man, literally, I would wake up every day because it's really, you know, it was really tough. It was a 16-hour race. Um, it, oh, my gosh, I had a hilarious moment when I was, I had, I cried on the top of a mountain. I arrived at my husband. My husband had to be my support and had to be, sorry, he is my support. <laughs> but on that occasion, he was, had to be my support as well. Um, and, I, I, you know, I genuinely, I was absolutely broken, arrived halfway through 
three quarters way through the bike ride at the top of this mountain, crying hysterically. Everybody rushes over because they think I'm injured. He goes, don't worry, you should just have a cup of tea, you should be fine. And I was. Um, so for me, and, and after Patagon Man, I just woke up, you know, for literally three months afterwards, buzzing. So I definitely get a buzz from it. I don't know whether all of you will, but personally I do. And I, you know, Michael Mosley, the doctor Michael Mosley says, I just don't get that buzz. So I feel very lucky that I do. Um, but it, yeah, just, I, I just, and it's a sense of achievement as well. We, you know, we did the, I go back to the, doing the marathon with my daughter and she had a really, really difficult moment in that. But she knows now that she had a very difficult moment in a marathon and she still finished. And I just think it's very, you, it, it, for me, it's sort of like putting in my backpack of little bits of power that I've got but that I can pull out in emergency. And I never know what the emergency is going to be. It might be interviewing someone tricky or not anymore. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it goes into my backpack of stuff that I can use later if I need to. I had one really, I'll finish. I had one really um, amazing experience at a difficult triathlon in Liverpool where I got in and it was, you know, that washing machine at the start. Somebody pulled off my goggles. Somebody else had pulled on my feet. You know, making it sound awful. It was really, really, really difficult. It was really panicky. And then I started swimming along and got a bit of water, a space in the water and looked down and it was just like this beautiful colours and I did it even today and these little fish, I'm thinking, oh look all the little fish, they come out to see us, it's so lovely and then I realised they were jellyfish I was like, but it's still lovely <laughs> and it was I still have this moment, I ha have that moment where I was in this kind of like zen-like moment, I still had the sensation of the water on my hands and today, because I do get nervous doing stuff like coming and talking to all of you um, and I just literally close my eyes, remember that moment, and everything's okay. So if you can find a little, spa little like, photograph in your mind that can calm you down, that is also really, really powerful. Probably got time for one more question. Just here. You've talked about pushing your boundaries. You've also talked about having to know boundaries, things that you won't overstep for yeah. your own safety. So there's a question of judgment. Yeah. Did you learn anything from the women you were with about how to judge what, which thing you should or shouldn't do? Um, yes, I think I think it was about gut feeling, and it was also about. I said, didn't I, at the end, about planning because you don't go into this, you know, without planning, without thinking about it, without having an emergency vehicle or, you know, indoor climbing, making sure that you know how the knots are and all the rest of it. Do you sort of mean? So I think there's a, there's a, you know, you have to use your rational side as well to make sure that you're not being, what I would think would be stupidly risky. And I do have, I definitely have that in me. Um, because, you know, it's not, you know, I don't do, I don't go do Patek and Man lightly. Do you sort of mean, I've, you know, you train for this stuff, don't you? You study for stuff. You wouldn't go into an exam, or I wouldn't, um, without having studied for it. So I think that's what I learned really most for them was that they, you know, they really, really take it really seriously. It's what they love, but they want to continue doing it so they actually plan properly. And I had one moment where I really messed, I really messed up in the book because um, it was a walk in Snowdon, Irari. I know, I know, how, I've been practicing my pronunciation because I did my Audible. If you don't want to read my book, you can have it on Audible, read by me. Um, but um, it was one of, you know, and I've done Snowden as I, you know, I ran up, I've done it about six times. And, you know, I had all the kits. I knew what I needed. I had my waterproofs, etc. And it was a sunny day at the bottom. And we were halfway up the pig track and it started to rain. And again, to your gut feeling. And I thought, oh, I, I was, we were the, it was a charity walk, actually. So I asked the people I, I was with, I said, one of the safety instructors, I said, do you think I should put my waterproofs? And he goes, no, 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 it's a passing shower. Listen to your gut, Louise. <laughs> By the time I got up, because once you're on the pig track at the top of it, it's really slippery in the rain. By the time I got up, it had gone from 15 degrees to two to two or three degrees. There was a wind and I was absolutely soaked and very, very close to hypothermia. So even if you plan, you know, listen to your gut. So you've got to do the rational planning and then also with your gut as well, because I mean, I was, I was really, really close and I just felt like such a stupid idiot. Because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's schoolgirl era, era, isn't it? Hypothermia on Snowden. I mean, who hasn't nearly done that? Um, but anyway, so yeah, those two things I would do. Unfortunately, we have- Oh, is that it? Thank you so much. We have run out of time. Um, there is, 
Um, two things that I've, I've picked up, I think, from, from actually reading Fearless or Reckless, which I fear was my sort of subconscious taking over while I was reading the book. Um, you met the women in their safe space. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lesson there for all of us that we should all have a safe space, a space where we can go, where we feel relaxed, comfortable, and if we want to push ourselves, push ourselves at the same time. Um, and a quote from you, which is, if you see it, you can be it. Um, and I think that's a great thing to take away, and I think that's for everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Louise, and I'm sure that you do as well, for an absolutely fascinating and inspirational, a lot of you use the term inspirational, and it certainly was inspirational, um, and for you for answering questions as well, because I don't know about you, but she's exactly the same as she was on the telly, isn't she? She's just exactly the same, which is great. Thank so you. natural and just smiles and giggles. I always think Louise is always a giggler. Um, I'm sure that you'll be keen to get hold of a copy of the book, or you may want to get the audio version, entirely up to you really. Um, we have got some pre-signed copies, so if you have to dash, make sure you get the pre-signed copy. But Louise is going to sign copies where she'll put little messages in for you as well. So if you want to buy some presents, things like that, is that what you told me to say? Yeah, she will sign it personally. Um, I can say this because I'm not on the radio, so that's fine. Um, and I, honestly, I didn't tell her that, but, but go on, carry on. Um, but they're being sold by our independent bookseller, uh, Fox Lane Book, who do a lot of these events, which is fantastic to have a local bookseller here. Um, so there will be signing. Um, thank you so much for coming. A reminder that this is only day three, is that right, Jen? Day three of the event. You were competing. I don't think you knew this, and I didn't tell you. Who against? You were competing against Michael Morpurgo. <laughs> there, you see, I knew I that. I love yeah. Michael Morpurgo. Yeah, so Michael was at your theatre. Thank run. you. I mean, that was a sellout For everybody well. who came yeah. here. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so there are lots of other fantastic events, which are free events. The festival is astonishing. Um, so please support it as much as you can, um, because it's a great thing to have across the city of uh, York. And, and maybe it might be a challenge that you set yourself, that you go to something that you know nothing about, but actually you'll leave that event and you will have learned something. And as Louise said, it doesn't matter what your challenge is, it could be just walking along the river, or just doing something that you don't normally do. Let's all go out and do it. Let's make the world a better place as well. And I think Louise has absolutely inspired each and every one of us. And I'd love you to show your appreciation.